be here now. If, therefore, thine eye be single, the whole body shall be full of light. That was from Matthew. When mind soars in pursuit of the things conceived in space, it pursues emptiness. But when man dives deep within himself, he experiences the fullness of existence. Meher Baba. We are only that, that is, exists only in the world of relativity. The vanity of man jibes at that statement. Man is accustomed to think himself important. His ego, he likes to think, holds the attention of superhuman powers. Gods and demons carefully watch his acts and thoughts, applauding some and punishing others. In himself, man has built a sub-office of the invisible tribunal of divine judges, and there he distributes praise and blame. So says Alexander David Neal in these secret oral teachings. Allegiance to the void implies denial of its voidness. The more you talk about it, the more you think about it, the further from it you go. Stop talking. Stop thinking. And there is nothing you will not understand. Return to the root and you will find the meaning. Pursue the light and you lose its source. Look inward and in a flash you will conquer the apparent and the void. All come from mistaken views. There is no need to seek truth only stop having views. So says Sing Sun. When the mind perceives an object, it is transformed into the shape of that object. So the mind which thinks of the divinity, which it worships, the Ishta Devata, is at length, through continued devotion, transformed into the likeness of that devata. By allowing the devata, the god, to occupy the mind for long, it becomes as pure as the devata. This is the fundamental principle of tantric sadhana, or religious practice. There are two views which are statements of dualism or non-dualism is the first, Advaitism and dualism, Dwaitism. When you realize that all talking and all thinking is dualistic, you've got to think about something and talk about something and talk to somebody, you realize that and when you realize that what we seek is non-dualistic, we understand the words of Teng San says, stop talking, stop thinking, and just be. It's an interesting question of what we're doing here tonight. 
why we're here. More words? I guess we have to be here until we don't have to be here anymore. That's the only way I can figure it. I'm the remotest idea why we're here. I mean, I can tell you game within game within game within game, but it, I don't think it has anything to do with it. I just turn out to be here and you turn out to be here. Well, is by our being here, are we getting deeper into a trap? <laughs> non dualist said we would be. He said, stop talking about it and just be it. <laughs> and what the dualist says is, you use the crutch until you don't need it anyway, anymore. Ramana Maharshi says, you use a stick to stir the funeral pyre, knowing full well that at the end you'll throw the stick into the fire too. It certainly must be apparent to all of us that this is a sort of a middle position we're in. But how can we use this gathering as an exercise in order to help ourselves on the way? This says nothing else to do anyway. <laughs> but become enlightened. We can retain a degree of consciousness throughout this whole experience in which we see it as an experience instead of collecting an experience. Wow, I got so high the other night. Man, whew. that's like a thing out there. Let's just all be here and dig this whole drama unfold. I was trying to figure out driving up Bayshore what about holy men trips? Because it's very heavy. I was in Los Angeles the other night, and uh, the scene got very far up. And at the end of the evening in this beautiful Unitarian church, there were several hundred people standing there for eternity. We were all just zombies. And people would come up to touch my feet. Now, I go through a number of trips about that, as you might well imagine. <laughs> The first time it happened to me in, in India, when I walked around, see, when you take on a certain garb of the dhoti and so on, walk barefoot with, you know, you're a sadhu, and then it is of spiritual merit to gristas or householders to honor a sadhu, to feed him or to touch his feet or something like that. And in India, there are 10 million sadhus who are sort of like uh, dropouts. They drop out specifically for the purpose of serving God. Now, within such a collection of people, obviously many of them are in it because it's an easy trip. And there's a lot of impurity, obviously. But it is a major spiritual active force in a country. And it's just what the very mobile young monks on the path are doing in America. They're becoming these spiritual uplifters that are just going from place to place, being straight, being here. You see them thumbing everywhere around the country, and they just, they're like, um, there's little short of being what Maya Baba dealt with as moths. You know, those God intoxicants, you'd find one sitting in a garbage dump somewhere. He'd been sitting there for 20 years, and he just sort of kept the spiritual scene in his community cool. That was his trip. And in a way, you see these kind of seeds of spirit just sort of drifting around, light going hither and yon. Now, when it first happened in India that somebody touched my feet, I, um, I got very uncomfortable because I felt like, a, as I've said before, an overage hippie, uh, explorer, you know, dilettante, whatever else you might call me. Um, but I didn't feel like a holy man. And Bhagwan Das, my guru brother, he's very, very far out guy. He's the one from Laguna Beach. <laughs> He said, well, when they do that, he's my teacher, or one of my teachers there. He's 23 or 4. He said, well, when, you, when they do that to you, you just honor them in your heart. You touch their feet in your heart, because you can't do it 
there because that's not the way sadhus do the thing. Okay, so I started to do that. And the other night when it started to happen again in America, you know, because it was, people understand that pran is emitted from high spiritual beings and people go through a trip. I've gotten so high being around you, you must be really high so I'll come touch your feet and get pran or I want to honor you or I love you or whatever it is. And I dug after a while that that was like a failure on my part. Because if the thing really was working, you would turn around and touch each other's feet or honor each other. In other words, everybody would see that it's us and that I wouldn't be in, we wouldn't start a new game of holy man. And after a number of people had done this, I was just so zonked I could hardly move because what happens is when they do that to you, they feed in all their love and energy and it just takes you out. I mean, it's like a gift of so much prime. And I was just going out and out and out and out. So once in a temple in, um, in Nanital, in India, and I was um, sitting in meditation, and it was looking out over a valley in the Himalayas, it was very beautiful, and I was quite uh, centered. And I was not very much in my body, and I suddenly experienced these hands, my eyes were closed, I suddenly experienced these hands massaging my arms and my legs, very strong hands. And of course, the, the thing happening to me brought me down to another state, because I couldn't, um, it, I wasn't harmonious with the model I had of the world, that people come up and rub your legs. And I opened my eyes just a trifle, and I came down. And there were this elderly couple who had come to pay homage at the temple, and they saw this sadhu meditating, and so they came up to do this thing, which was a thing to help me with my work. And of course, it got me so high because of the purity with which they did it, because there was no hustle, it was so pure. And so I... There's a, a sequel to that story, a strange one, but uh, the other side of the coin, the yin-yang of it all, that on the train from uh, Borelli to Delhi, a night train, Bhagwan Das and I had third class seats, or fourth, whatever the lowest class is, where you go with your knees up to your chin, and you, you know, there are a hundred people in a room about this big, and everybody's grooving, you know, all the muscles and bones, and it's just a mass of, oh, you know, the train goes about 18 miles an hour for 10 hours. And you might as well give in. See, it's the surrender to humanity because if you fight India, it's horrible, you know. And the minute you surrender to the Divine Mother, it's, oh, wow. You know, she just, ah, oh, you know. And she is the mother. She's really the mother. And so I was looking forward to this scene because I know how I have to go through all my trips about everything before I surrender into that. But I know it demands it, finally. It's a very unrelenting teacher. And um, uh, this baggage man came along and he said, Sadhus, American Sadhus, from America. Yeah, sure. He said, uh, you know, sit in carriage. Come, come, come. I run baggage cars. I have a whole empty baggage car. I'll give just you. Wow, that's pretty far. Sure, man. So we go, and it's a baggage car. It's got places to put bags, and, but there's a place you can sort of stretch out on the floorboards. It's sort of like that, you know. And he says, I won't let anybody, you know, what I want, I'll come in and visit, I'll knock. Closes the door, and he says, all the freight's in the next car. And he goes away, and the train starts. And uh, after a while, his knock, and we let him in, and he says, oh, sadhus, I am so honored to have you here. And I was starting on my trip again, you know, like the, the people up in the temple. And I'm sitting there and I'm in the lotus position and I'm just sort of going with the train and going out on the train on the wheels and so on. And uh, I feel these hands on my legs massaging. I thought, oh, wow, I'm going to get this trip again. You know, this is like so much, you know. And I really settle into it. See, I just, ah. Oh. 
Then the hands keep going higher and higher and higher and higher and higher until I think, oh, wow, a thought form enters my head. So, <laughs> so all I did was I just created a field in which that thought form didn't exist. I just became a statue. You know, and it really turns you off to make it with a statue, you know. It just gives nothing at all. There's just no one home, you know. So he immediately finished, you know, he lost interest. And he said, I can't keep this place for just you people. I've got to let many people in. And then he let in, you know, all of us again. <laughs> uh, uh, so this happened in Los Angeles, see, this, this feet touching business, and uh, I thought, well now, this is getting a little out of hand, because I don't think we can handle all that, you know. And I sat there, it was so beautiful, and it was pure, but it was scary because of the impurity of, of my thoughts, you know. Finally, I, I guess I got to my point, and I stood up and I said, well everybody, that's showbiz. <laughs> So the latest report I got yesterday was somebody said, they heard somebody say, uh, oh, Albert, oh, you know, he's that stand-up Jewish comic. <laughs> Actually, I'm a sit-down one. <laughs> Why I've been, uh, become a holy man, <laughs> is because there's nothing else to do. But why I come on like a holy man, in other words, why I play the holy man game, being a holy man and playing the holy man game are quite different. Most of everybody here is a holy man, but not everybody's playing the holy man game. It's a game with rules and rituals and, you know, very stylized thing. It's like a barber or a policeman or the holy man. You know. <laughs> But the reason I play it is very much because I understand the only thing I can do is work on myself. That's the only thing I can do either for my enlightenment or for the enlightenment of any other being in the, in the in form, is to work on my own consciousness. And I dig that when I'm around a certain kind of consciousness, that I'm uh, helped greatly. I'm opened up greatly. And that consciousness is called, in India, in Sanskrit, it's called satsang. And in Buddhism, it's called sangha. You know, in Buddhism, you take the, the um, you make the three statements. Uh, Buddham saranam gachami, dharmam saranam gachami, sangham saranam gachami. As I take refuge in the Buddha, I take refuge in a being who is enlightened. Somebody makes it. And in Buddha consciousness. I take refuge in the Dharma, meaning the law or the way or the process, the method. The karma, the sanskaras, that's all Dharma. the laws under which you're functioning in nature and all the astral and causal planes that keep you being what you're being at this moment. That's your dharma. And I take refuge in the sangha or the community of monks who are on the path. Now, there is a stage in one's development, in one's opening, where you are still using methods. And one of the methods, this is the time when the tree is very young, as Ramakrishna says, and it's the time when you're surrounded, you surround it by a fence to keep it from being broken down. And that's the time when you surround yourself with beings who, are, who understand what you understand. Hmm. That's Sangha, Satsang. So I dug that by being a holy man, in the game sense, 
that the only people that would hang out with me would be people who were digging to be around holy men, which is a self-selecting factor. I mean, psychiatrists, for the most part, won't be around holy men because they'll say they're nuts and they don't hang out around psychotics. <laughs> Government officials, for the most part, won't hang out with holy men. Up-and-coming young businessmen won't hang out with holy men. If you read one of the highest books that's ever been written, The Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, it's a big, fat book. There was a guy by the name of M, who was a devotee of Ramakrishna's, and he had a phenomenal memory. And every day he just dedicated years of his life to copying down everything that was said at these darshans where Ramakrishna hung out. And you watch businessmen come to Ramakrishna trying to hold on to their businessmanness, you know, their corner on the energy market on the physical plane. <laughs> and you'd see people from every walk of life, and you'd see phony holy men coming to Ramakrishna, and he was really doing them in, <laughs> lovingly. The other day I was staying with Laura Huxley down in, uh, in Los Angeles, and Laura said to me, everything you're doing sounds so beautiful, but what about all the people that are really lost? I mean, what are you doing about, for anybody like that? After all, everybody that comes to have darshan is somebody who's come to have darshan. That already is a self-selecting factor. And I said, well, as far as I understand light, it just spreads. And that each of us just emits whatever light we have, and it just keeps spreading through everybody it touches all the time. And everything that goes out in waves from each of us, those high beings who are here, who are feeding energy into me, that energy is coming out again for us. We're taking it out, we're taking it out, we're taking it out, and people we will be meeting a month from tonight will be receiving the light that we are sharing at this moment. The purification just goes out like ripples on a lake. And I thought to myself, if I get highest when I'm alone, which is true, when I do the purest work, why am I sitting with other people? Why am I seeking this? Why am I creating? What kind of desires are creating this phenomenon? Since your desires are creating me, as you see me, you might see me as a, a hippie playing a role, you might see me as a holy man, you might see me as old Dick Alpert, you might see me as Ram Dass, you might see me as somebody who's been to India, you might see me as another cat who's laying out a line, like... Who knows? That's your desires. But from my desires, that's all this. I thought, why aren't I sitting in the temple in the Himalayas? What am I doing here? I can sit in the temple in the Himalayas, this is nothing keeping me. Just go to the Himalayas and sit in the temple. And then I remembered sitting in the temple in the Himalayas. And I sat in the temple in the Himalayas, and I would, the way I would do it is I would, in the mornings, I would meditate to calm my mind down. I'd sit, I'd have my, do all my asanas and my pranayama. First you go and you take an ice cold bath in the river, 4.30 in the morning in the dark, chanting, that's far out. And you go to the toilet and you do the whole thing and then you come in and you light your incense and your candle at the puja table and you, you do your puja. And then you meditate and you do breathing, pranayama, and then you do asanas, body, hatha yoga, then tea, or whatever you had. That was my addiction, was tea. Then I'd sit by the river as the sun came up and look out, and then I would start to meditate. And when I'd meditate, I would do usually this method that I've talked about a lot, the method enunciated by the Southern Buddhists, the Theravadas, the Hinayanas. It's 
See, if you went to certain monasteries, you'd say, well, man, this is all groovy here, but this is too much of a scene. I'm going to a monastery. So you're now transported to, say, Salon or someplace like that, and you knock on the door of a monastery, and you say, I'd like to be enlightened. And they say, come this way. And you think, aha, I'm in. No, I'm in. I got one. Uh, when we got to um, Sarnath, that's where Buddha delivered his first sermon at Deer Park. We were staying usually at hostels or at church temples. And we got to Sarnath, and there is a Tibetan Buddhist temple and a Jain temple and there's the Indian Mahabodhi Society, and they have a hostel, but you gotta pay 50 cents a night. And then there was a Chinese Buddhist temple that was very remote feeling, awesomely remote. So the Tibetan temple was full because the Dalai Lama was coming because they were gonna consecrate a new school. The Jain temple didn't like Westerners because they had a lot of trouble and they called everybody hippies. The Mahabodhi Society charged. So we sat in the chai walla, the chai stand, the tea stand, figuring out what to do next. And my guru brother said, well, go get us into the Chinese Buddhist temple. I said, but they don't take Westerns. He said, well, go do it. So he never asked me to do anything. He always fed me and took care of me. So I figured if he wants me to do it, I guess I do it. So I walked into this very Chinese inner garden place in the temple. Awesome, huge uh, sitting stone Buddha in the temple. And that's practically all there is. And it's a huge building as high as this. And there's nothing else practically in the room. There's two Buddhas back to back, actually. Little one behind. And I found a man washing the floor. And I said to him, uh, I and another American would like to stay here to study. And he says, he didn't understand. Come in this way. And he let us me into a room. You stay here. And pretty soon as I sat there, these monks started to drift into the room. They smiled and I smiled. Until there were about eight or nine of them. People, monks and others from the temple. And uh, there was a big fan going around. And then this old man monk came in and he sat down and he motioned for a young interpreter, and he says, what does he want? So I said, well, this other fellow and I are traveling, and we would like, we're making a religious pilgrimage, and we'd like to study for two weeks, and we'd like to stay at your temple. And he looked at me, and they looked, and I didn't know what was going to happen next. And he burst out laughing. And then he got up and walked out. And then all the other nine monks got up and walked out, and I was left there alone. I thought, well, what do you suppose just happened? I can't. <laughs> I don't know what just happened. And then a fellow came along. He said, come this way. And took me to a room, opened it, said, this is the bed, this is the bathroom, and he gave me the key, and that was it. I'll tell you just, a, just another smidgen of that part of the drama, because it was so beautiful. About the middle of the night, around three in the morning, I was sort of in a sleep, half meditation, half sleep state, and I started to hear this awesome chanting. So I went to the door, and I opened the door, and it was, the sky was beautiful, the moon was full, and it was all like a, uh, all old Chinese-type trees. And uh, a pagoda-style roofs and all, with a moon on it. And there was this chanting that was coming from somewhere else. And I stuck along by the temple till I came to the temple door, and I realized it was coming from inside the temple, and there was a candle lit in the temple. And I didn't dare look in the temple because it seemed like it was none of my business. I hadn't been invited in, and maybe this was some ceremony, and they didn't tell me about things. I just sort of sat down outside to, like, tune in on it. <laughs> And it went on and on, and I assumed I, they've got many more people living here than I thought. They must have 30, 40 people here. And after about two hours of this absolutely beautiful chanting coming from all different spaces and so on, it stopped, and out walked a little old man. 
And I followed him, and <laughs> there was a gate in the front of the temple that was locked. It was locked until seven in the morning. And the game was very far out because it had the swastika on it, you know, which is the, you know. But when you look at it from one side and you're standing there holding bars, looking through a swastika, it takes you on an interesting side trip. And <clears throat> he walked up to this huge eight-foot gate. He must have been well into his middle 60s. And I thought, we just stand there together until the gate opened. And uh, he just climbed over the gate and walked away. <laughs> So I figured all the other 39 guys went out another way, because I didn't understand the temple. So the next morning at around 3.30 or 4, I got up again, and I went in. This time I peeked, <laughs> and there was this one guy. So, you know, in one corner was a huge drum, and in another corner was a cymbal, and somewhere else were bells, and he was working with the echoes of this building. And he was just walking around chanting to different walls and different ceilings. And you knew he had been doing this like for maybe 30, 40 years, every night in the middle of the night. And it was that kind of music. I was meditating in the temple, and I was doing the rising falling. See, if you went into the temple in Ceylon, they'd say, come this way, and they'd take you in a room, and they'd say, you sit right here on this mat. And they say, please notice that right in the middle of your, below your rib cage, when you breathe, certain muscles move. So you breathe, and you see that certain muscles move. And they say, when the muscle moves, follow it. So you follow it, it goes out, and then it goes down, and it goes out, and it goes down. There are a lot of muscles in there, but some, one of them goes out when you breathe in, and it goes down when you breathe out, or out and in. And that one you tune in on, and every time it goes up, you think rising. And every time it goes down, you think falling. And the man says, you understand? And you say, yes. He says, thank you, and he leaves. You came all the way to Salon, see? And you've joyously been accepted into a temple. And you've been put in a room, and you've been told to watch this muscle go up and down. Right? And the door's been closed, and that's it. Every day, your food's left outside the door. Everybody smiles at you when they see you. Okay. Now what, do you get enlightened? Okay. Well, I'll tell you what happened in my part of this journey. That I sat in the temple and I did rising, falling, rising, falling, rising, falling. And I would go deep into it and I would get into waves of bliss and then a thought would come up. A thought form. And the thought forms, some of them at first were very agitated little thought forms like your knee hurts. Okay. Or maybe you ought to have another cup of tea before you begin. Okay. Or uh, do you think the male's here yet? <laughs> or these damn flies. Whatever it is, one of those little ones. Thought forms. Most of them don't capture your consciousness after a while because you're used to them, you know, and they're like demons that you had visit before, and you're welcome, sit over there, you know, it's cool. Have some tea, biscuits. We're all here, it's groovy. <laughs> and you go on doing your thing, rising and falling. They don't want to interrupt you, really. I mean, they just want to create a little hassle. They just want to be known that they're present. You honor them. You don't try to stop them. You don't say, get out, I'm busy meditating. <laughs> Sure, you got a pain in your knee, come on in. Yeah. Might as well anyway, it's gonna come in, you know, what do you want to do? <laughs> And then I'd have some of these thoughts like um, now I wonder what I'll do back in the United States. Now those I couldn't dismiss so easily. Those would fascinate me, see. And I'm just sitting there, hanging out. I mean, one of the hippies in Kathmandu said to me that meditation passes the time to lunch. <laughs> and I was passing the time to lunch, and it was a good thing to think about. What do you do back in America? And 
Once I was thinking about that, and in that afternoon, or I think it was that afternoon, maybe the next morning, I got a message that Maharaji wanted to see me. And I went over to see Maharaji, and I came to him, and he said, uh, you were in America last night. It's like, who do you think you're kidding? I mean, you can leave your body around, but who do you think you're fooling? We know where you are. You're in America. So after a while, when you're just doing this kind of idiot's delight, this rising, falling, rising, falling, rising, falling, and you go through everything you can say to yourself, like, you know, I've got a whole routine of these now. You say, because they, they've blown my mind so many, I run through them all, I think. You know, things like, for this you got a PhD. You know, <laughs> rising, falling, rising, falling, rising, falling. <laughs> See, it is a stand-up comic routine. <laughs> Like match. <laughs> Maharaji once said to me in India, he said, called me over and he whispered in my ear, you make many people laugh in America. And I said, yeah. He said, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> See? <laughs> It's a two-in-one trip. <laughs> you know, after about two weeks, the guy comes back and he says, how are you doing? He says, doing what? <laughs> and he understands that you haven't yet heard the first message. So he says, well, I'll tell you, did you notice that right below your rib cage, there are these little muscles? <laughs> He's very patient in his whatever accent it is he speaks with. You know, and he takes you through the thing. You're a Westerner after all. You, you gotta understand, you, you think you gotta do something. Now, all that that exercise does, when you do it, by the way, is it helps you burn away all the places you aren't. It helps you burn away all your desires and your attachments by noting them, bringing them into consciousness. Because what you do is you focus on one thing, which could be your breath going in and out. It could be a point of a candle flame, like two hands away from your eyebrow, out at the point equal at the height of your ajna is a good place for it. You just sit and hang out with a candle. And there's the candle and there's you, and you're just hanging out together. You're not saying, I am going to see Christ in the candle, or light become me, or you mean you can do all those, those are other trips. But the other, the simplest one, this one of one-pointedness, is you just hang out with a candle. There's you and the candle, and then there's all these thoughts. Did you ever see in the spring, and I know in New Hampshire it's certainly very clear, the spring all those tiny little bugs that hang around lights, millions of them. Well, those are like your thoughts. There's you and the candle and all these thoughts. But because you've got the candle as a focal point, you see the thoughts as thoughts, rather than going on each one's trip. Because if you don't have any focal point at all, if you don't have any focal point at all, every time there's another stimulation, you'll just go off on that trip. And then you are at the whim of your senses and you're at the whim of your thoughts. And that's like everybody's trip every day, all through life, most of the time. That's totally in the illusion.
The other end of that scale, of course, is where there's nobody there, and then you're responding to every stimulus. That's when you finish. That's the no mind state. But where you still are attached, addicted to your rational mind, the game is to bring it down to one point. And then just keep hold one point and then watch everything else do its dance, all the feelings, all the body sensations, all the thoughts just going by like so much hamburger. I've got to save the world. I'm sick. I've got to do more hatha yoga, whatever your trip is. You see it, there's another trip. You see your own desires. You see yourself creating thought forms. And you dig that thought forms determine what you see around you all the time. I mean, I was looking out here before and I saw two huge eyes of my guru. You know, nose coming down. I was sort of standing right on the tip of the nose, looking into these two big eyes. Thinking, wow, man, you've come at last. Hmm. Which level do you want? Do you want to focus in on the cells? Hmm. Or do you want to see the organism? Push the cells apart. And you focus on one point and you just stay in that point and everything just keeps drifting by until there is only that point. Now that is the farthest you can go in dualism. It's one pointedness. There's you seeing one point. That's on this side of the doorway. It's all within the illusion in Buddhist terms. It doesn't exist. Nothing's happened yet. Of course, in Buddhist, nothing's ever going to happen either. But nothing's happened yet. I mean, you know. And at that point, the game gets very interesting. Because at that point, the point is to give up the place you've just been standing. The highest meditation in that direction is done by Ramana Maharshi, is given by Ramana Maharshi. And it's called Vichara Atma, the method of self-inquiry, or who am I? It's an absolute, fierce, no-nonsense method of taking you gate, gate, paragate, parasamgate, bodhiswaha, taking you beyond the beyond, beyond the ocean of existence. But all you need to be able to do is be totally one-pointed. Because if you can't be one-pointed in mind, you can't do any method in yoga. Hatha yoga is a joke without one-pointedness of mind. Certainly bhakti, devotion, how can you sing love songs to somebody and at the same time be wondering what time you're going to go home? I mean, bhakti is totally one-pointed, it's just your beloved, that's the whole idea of bhakti yoga. So dhyana yoga, the yoga of meditation, the highest method you can use work assuming that you are so totally committed to doing what you're about to do that you can do it because there's nothing else to do, because there aren't any attachments to pull you away anymore. So what Ramana Maharshi suggests is you sit down and you put the I, your I, 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 or you can make it E-Y-E even, put it right in the middle of your head. And then you say, I am not this form, body. And you experience the form as object and the I as subject. And then you break down the parts of the body and you do this. You say, I am not the five organs of motion. Arms, I am not the arms. And you experience your arm and you see it as an object, you see it doing its thing. You see how the wrist works and the fingers. And, wow, look at that, it's an exquisite mechanism. It can do fantastic things, you know. Prehensile, you get awed by the prehensile trip, you know, that we got on a while back. I'm not the arms, I'm not the legs. 
I'm not the tongue. And you do your tongue and you see your tongue from eye and see eyes here and the tongue's there. Arms, I am not the arms. And you experience your arm and you see it as an object, you see it doing its thing. You see how the wrist works and the fingers. And, wow, look at that, it's an exquisite mechanism. It can do fantastic things. You know, prehensile, you get awed by the prehensile trip you know, that we got on a while back. I'm not the arms, I'm not the legs, I'm not the tongue. And you do your tongue and you see your tongue from eye and see eyes here and the tongue's there. I am not the anal sphincter, it's the fourth organ of motion. You feel your anal sphincter tightening and loosening and you see it there doing its thing and the eye is in the middle of your head. Fifth one is I am not my genitals. And that takes many people on a number of side trips with a number of demons dropping by. You experience your genitals and you experience it from the eye in the middle of your head and you see it as object. Then he says, you say I am not my five organs of sense. Now you listen to your ears hearing. You note your ears hearing. Don't identify with your ears hearing, just note them hearing. Note your eyes seeing. Note your nose smelling. Note your tongue tasting. Note your skin feeling. I am not any of those. See, they're just doing their thing in nature. And that isn't who I am either. I'm right back here. I know where I am. Then you say, I'm not the five internal organs. I'm not digestion, and you experience the stomach digesting. I am not excretion, and you experience the intestines. I am not respiration, breathing. Circulation, blood. Perspiration, sweat. Each of these systems, you note it in your body, bring it to consciousness, see it as object, and stay in the eye in the middle of your head. And there's one more. See, the system is, I am not this body, one, then five, 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 then one. Now you're ready for the one. You're down to the place where you've gotten rid of everything else, and all there is is the eye in the middle of your head. And then you say, I am not the thought of I. I am not this thought. Which thought am I not? I am not the thought. I am not the thought. Oh, you're not that? Oh, you're not that? You're not that either. You're not that either. You've got, you've got the leverage on the system? See, every thought you think, you're not that one either. Every place you try to stand, you can't stand there either. What you've done is you put yourself out on the farthest branch and you just cut off the branch. And you see your own thoughts going by like, like news flashes on the Times building. I am not this thought. No, not that either. You see your thoughts going by like news flashes on the Times building. That's the way you should be seeing this whole scene now going down, by the way. Just as stuff happening. You have to collect it, it's just stuff happening. And that's what takes you through the doorway. That's what takes you from dualism to non-dualism. Because at that point, you give up the experiencer. You give up the knower who knows. See, God doesn't sit around saying, hey, man, I'm God. He just is God. He just is a consciousness. He just is manifesting. He's not laying it on anybody, it's just, is that.
That's why it's reasonable to say that higher consciousness is exactly the distance from you of your next thought. See, if you think you're going to go to India to find a guru, you're going to be thinking in India just like you're thinking here. And sooner or later, somebody's going to put you in a room, see, and tell you to bring your mind to one-pointedness, and they're going to leave you there till you do it. And the person that's going to do it to yourself is you. Because you dig that your out-of-control mind is just running the show all the time. So that the whole process of bringing your mind to one-pointedness becomes a central matter. Now the people that say bhakti is the only way in the Kali Yuga are saying in order to bring your mind to one-pointedness, use the heart, use emotions, use love. Love is a way to generate the energy to override all the other demons and get you to one-pointedness. And they say dhyan yoga or the yoga of mind beating mind, the Western mind can't work with it because it's too, he'll, he'll be too cute. He'll undermine it every time. Only the Westerner's heart is strong enough to override the control of the ego. When you go to try to develop the witness in yourself, the guy who sees or the gal who sees it all going down every day, all the time. That's another part of, it's like in the Gurdjieff system, self-remembering. That's also in the rational mind on this side of the, of the doorway. See? It's part of your rational mind that's digging the rest of your ra rational mind. But what happens is that witness wakes up for one second and then the ego takes over the witness. If you want a whole catalog of the way that's done, read St. John of the Cross's Dark Night of the Soul. It's got a whole list of them. It's got the groovy one where you've just done pranayama and you've just come into high light, see? You've just transcended your ego. And the ego pitters around behind you and pats you on the back and says, pretty good. <laughs> And you realize you have an adversary that you hadn't bargained on, you know. Because everywhere you are, the ego's close behind. It's like Mary's little lamb. It's like your shadow. Did you ever try to beat your shadow? The ego's exquisite at taking over any game you can conceive in form, of course. It can make itself in any form. That's who your adversary is. How are you going to stab the enemy when, the, when the, the, the knife you're going to use to stab him is the enemy? And the arm you're stabbing it with is the enemy. And the thought you're desiring to stab the enemy is the enemy. Ah. Gets very heady. Krishna says in the Gita, he who thinks there is a slain or a slayer well, one who is slain knows not me. There are so many ways that we can identify in a dualistic framework, in a devotional way, in a very high way, and get stuck. Get stuck at the most exquisite causal planes. And that's what I dug was the problem with the holy man trip, that it tended to play into the desire of people to create dualism. Paul Farmer, who's been traveling with me, said to me, man, what you create is a feeling in people that you're somewhere they're not. And I said, well, that's their problem. That is the problem of he of us who is them. That's our uncooked karma that we're still looking for it out there. Because as I've said before, it must be obvious to everybody that everything I'm saying, you already know. All we are doing is reciting it to one another. We're talking to ourselves. All I am is the mouthpiece for us at this moment.
And I'm saying what we have to say to ourselves, what I have to say to myself. Since there's only us, I guess we all have to say it to ourselves or we wouldn't be here. Tonight we're going to attempt an exercise in one pointedness. About uh, three years ago, I was in Berkeley. I was studying for the summer with Ali Akbar Khan with Mahaprush Mishra, the tabla, at the Berkeley summer school, the summer school, in Ali Akbar Khan school. And um, while I was there, um, I was one day driving, I had an old school bus, and I was driving it across the Oakland Bay, no, the San Mateo Bridge. And I picked up a hitchhiker, and we grew together for a while, and then he asked if he could bring a friend over, and he came to visit one day, and we hung out for a number of hours talking. And uh, at the end of that time, the friend said that he played the guitar, and he'd like to play for me sometime, and I thought, well, that's nice. But I think I'm finished with music. Because I'm at the predicament now where when I take my earplugs and stick them in my ears and go inside, I hear the sounds of the universe. I start to hear ohm, and I start to hear choruses, and I start to hear flutes, and I start to hear, but they're divine. And I begin to realize what a gross form it is coming in through my senses. I mean, it's groovy the way music is, but it's still stuff, and behind the stuff, you start to get into this divine sound. And one of the highest yogas is what's called Shabd Yoga, also called Nad Yoga, which is a yoga of inner sounds. And you can just put in earplugs, or do the Vaishnava Mudra, or something like that, close off your ears, and just start to listen to your inner sounds. And there are nine of them. My teacher wrote in a slate, the ninth one is the sound of thunder. After that, you will have a fever for 24 hours. <laughs> I mean, they know, man. They write down the edge. <laughs> and then he put a footnote. He says, the sound, he had listed them, and when he came opposite the um, flute, he had put an asterisk and he put a note down. He said, the flute is so beautiful, it is like a deer being caught in a trap. You can't go on, because the flute's so beautiful. He says, after, much, uh, after a few days, with much abhyas, practice, you can get on with it. In other words, groove with it for a little while and get on. He's pointing out where you might trip, you know, along the way to help you. That was the inner sound. So when this fellow offered to play the guitar, I sort of, well, that's groovy, but man, like, you know, that's not my trip. And as I was getting ready to go to India, I was visiting a fellow in Berkeley, and he said, I'd like you to hear this tape. And he put on the tape of guitar. And it was a very beautiful thing, and it was sufficiently beautiful, so I had my tape recorder there. I said, can I make a tape, because I'm going to India, and I'd like to have that with me. So I took it to India, and every time I would get sort of into certain states, I would play things like this guitar business. At that time, I did not realize, really, that the same guy was those two guys. Now, I came back to America, and about two weeks ago, I was talking with uh, somebody about um, Sufism. And they said to me, this Sufi teacher said that Bach is very high, that he was one of the last Westerners that understood in the total plan the role of rhythm and structure. And he understood it so well and when he spoke, it spoke to those places in a person, and it was like causal knowledge in nonverbal form. He was telling you how he was, he was describing the universe at a plane that was not in the physical plane. He was just using sound, taking you out on sound. It's like mantra, same thing as mantra. It takes you a certain place through rhythmic structure. And at that time, I remember thinking, gee, wouldn't it be a groove to try an exercise with Bach? Because that will bring the whole Western business back into perspective and so on. And last Tuesday night here, after I was leaving, a fellow came up and he said, do you remember sitting and talking one day? He said, I play the guitar. 
and that was the guy that played Bach. So he is here tonight. I said to him, why don't you play next Tuesday night with us? He said, I'd love to. He's a lover of Baba. Awesome. And um, I thought we would do this as a meditation exercise. Um, now, in order to do that, you can get caught in the sheer beauty of the structure you're going to hear, and you can stay as the enjoyer of the beauty. If you do that, you've blown the exercise. It's groovy, and enjoy it this lifetime, and, you know, hear some more guitar, right? Or you can use this as an exercise. Just become one with the sound. Let it do it to you. Let the music do you instead of you listening to the music. Forget you're a listener and just be the music. <laughs> 